Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more from the MediaMonarchy.com kingdom. And we've got our old friend Andy Colvin on the line. And we're both West Virginia boys, so I wanted to talk about American Ultra. Andy Colvin, welcome back to Media Monarchy. Hi. Uh, good, good, glad uh, to be here. So... I saw this film uh, now, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, and it was originally released, I think, around August of 2015. And there are so many films, a lot of times it's hard to pay attention, and it's only as the months go by, you maybe hear things and people suggest things, and you go, oh, this film American Ultra is some CIA mind control thing. So I watch the film, and I immediately start firing off tweets and messages to friends and people in the alternative media asking, have you seen this thing? Have you seen this thing? Are you aware of this? Do you know that this thing is out there? And what better way, because the film is set in West Virginia, than to talk to a fellow West Virginian, Andy Colvin. Now, you and I, I think, probably last talked when I was still producing Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis, but you and I talked here. I looked through my records, actually, on 4-20-2012 on the old Media Monarchy show. So it's been a while since we've talked. So, again, welcome back. Thanks. So, Thanks. Uh, did you know anything about this movie? Had you did you had you heard about it, trailers or any of that? Uh, <clears throat> my girlfriend had mentioned that, hey, there's a movie about a slacker from West Virginia is a Manchurian candidate, and somehow I, I don't know, I guess the, the CIA must have blocked my memory of that, because I, I ended up not, not, not watching it, <laughs> but uh, I watched it last week, and it's kind of funny, because the slacker angle, you know, that's, that's my claim to fame, I guess, is that <clears throat> the connection to the movie Slacker, and, and I've, I guess I've come to be seen as a poster boy for slackerdom. So to see those two things together, um, together uh, at last. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, not only the slacker thing, but just the whole mind control thing, because that was really what I was studying a lot during the '80s and '90s. Because I actually felt like um, I had just barely missed being one of those people, because my grade school um, in West Virginia was um, sort of an experimental magnet school and we had at least about uh, at least six genius kids in there and the military was coming around actually we don't know who it was but it was it was uh, guys with multiple insignias on their on their uniforms so they'd have navy and army um and and they were supposedly working under the guise of a film crew from Yale or Harvard who was supposedly studying this new school, um, one of the Mothman witnesses in the group uh, later s- told me that she had been taken in dozens of more times and studied uh, in private and asked to memorize all this stuff. And they found that she, they thought she had total recall, so they were really focusing on her. And they actually... Uh, seemed to kick me out of it because I was, I've always been a subversive, you know, uh, and an artistic type. So I wasn't, I do, I did have a photographic memory, but I think they just thought maybe I was too, uh, too left wing. My, it could be because of my dad though. I don't know. My dad was, uh, the Colvins have never, <laughs> have always been in trouble with the ruling establishment going back to, <laughs> Well, way back in England, um, we've always been rebel rouser, rabble rousers against the crown. And my dad, or uh, uh, well, my dad worked for the Roosevelts for a while as a private pilot. Um, we have Verplank Colvin in the family who was friends with Teddy Roosevelt, but but Verplank was gay. He's a guy that. Um, founded the Adirondack State Park. It's the largest state park in the country. And and but he's been kind of wiped off the the ecological map. They only talk about John Muir these days or I can't think of any of the other ones. But for Plank was a stone cold ecologist who he wrote many books about the flora and fauna of the Hudson Valley and and eventually I think he and Teddy were lovers actually. That's my that's what everything points to. Well, let's 
<laughs> I'm getting off track cool, here. But. Cool your jets there on that. We're talking about this kind of rock and roll movie, American Ultra, which I think in a lot of ways, and I showed the trailer to Cassie, and she was like, oh, so it basically mm-hmm. looks like it makes CIA, MK Ultra mind control stuff cool. It's all like rock and roll and whiz bang, and the trailers really do make it look that way. So the film was actually released by Lionsgate, and they put out a lot of the sort of leading cultural, you know, propaganda pieces around now, Hunger Games being most among them. Um, The film is directed by Nima Norazadi, and it's not actually a name that I really know, and has only done one other film called Project X, which was not the Matthew... Broderick monkey movie. It was a different movie made back in in 2012. The name that jumps out as far as the production of this goes is Max Landis. Now, it's the son of John Landis, and he has written and sold a handful of screenplays. So when I start to dig in that, it makes me wonder, why would he write a a rock and roll action comedy movie about MKUltra, an actual declassified CIA program that was all about torture and mind control and abuse. So I look at his other, you know, things that he's written, and to me it doesn't look as though this is the kind of shit that he always wants to write about. To me, it kind of just looks like he's a young guy who's writing a lot of different kinds of stories. Some are rom-coms. The other one, though, that does jump out at me is a newer release that he wrote, and it's called Mr. Right, and it is about a hitman who kills his bosses instead of the intended targets. So that seems to be the only other sort of maybe parapolitical films that he's written. So I actually tweeted at Max Landis while I was doing my tweet and message frenzy after I saw this film, and I sent him actually the link to the Vigilant Citizen article, American Ultra, another attempt at making MK Ultra cool. And I just said, I was like, hey, I don't know if you've addressed any of this before, but what do you think about this? With the link oh, to, yes, to, to the article. Hey, and he, what, he replied, one word, ridiculous. <laughs> and that's all I, I got. You were talking to me, you were talking about what, okay, what he said. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a, so I no, I tweeted the the Vigilant Citizen article to the screenwriter of the film, Max Landis, to see what he thought about being accused of of making MK Ultra look cool in a movie. And he replied and said it was ridiculous. I want to try and follow up and see if there's any more to be had there, but I think the interesting part is when you get into this film, it's basically, and we won't go through all the plot points, but of course there will be, as they say, spoilers in this. It's basically set in a fictional West Virginia town called Lyman, L-I-M-A-N. There is no town in West Virginia called Lyman. And it's Jesse Eisenberg. He plays a stoner dead-end kid who works at this grocery store that doesn't seem to really have anyone working there. And he's got his girlfriend, Kristen Stewart. And then you pull out and you do all the whiz bang kind of, you know, enemy of the state looking satellite work. And then you go over to Langley, Virginia, to the CIA, where you basically learn that old MK Ultra programs are either being resurrected or hidden. And two CIA project managers are basically battling it out with these human assets. That's essentially what the film is about as Jesse Eisenberg becomes reactivated. So he goes from being West Virginia stoner loser who who can't even get on a plane without crippling panic attacks into a super bone-breaking, rock-and-roll, ass-kicking assassin once he hears these kind of magic words from his former CIA project manager at the what they call, I think one of them's called Operation Tough Guy, and Jesse Eisenberg was the only, you know, the only one that worked out of that program. So basically the movie then turns into, oh, he's activated as a spy. The other opposing CIA officer wants to send his mind control assassins in to try and kill the good guy mind controlled assassins. And the bad guy CIA agent is played by, oh, it's Topher Grace from that 70s show. He's so funny with his one liners about sending drones to kill people and using fake news to cover up stories that happen. There's so much in this movie that we basically talk about all the time in the alternative media. And I think that kind of speaks to, for me, what I've been talking about for a little while is that it seems like mainstream culture ate conspiracy culture, and now it's sort of being 
regurgitated back out in this weird mishmash. Thoughts? Absolutely. I want to hear more. You're good. <laughs> I, I, things you're saying, uh, you echo exactly what, what I what I thought about this. Uh, when, it, when it all first came in, in the, I'm thinking back, <clears throat> you know, there was a time when we've republished uh, Operation Mind Control, by the way. That was came out in '78, and back then it was dangerous to really express any about anything about this. Uh, people would be killed over it, and then slowly they started doing these spy movies, and then slowly each 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 Manchurian candidate became more and more cool, or or you could somehow you know uh, identify with them. You know they they didn't really mean to become, you know. A Manchurian candidate. They were mind controlled into it. Uh, uh, Jason Bourne, <clears throat> so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And there's another one of those coming out soon. Yeah. So now it really, this is really to me the culmination of all that. It's now anybody can be a mind controlled assassin. It could be you, and you just don't remember it. And I've been joking about this for for 30 years that I've been one of these people. I didn't really ever believe it. But I did go to this school where people were tracked in this way, and 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 it's possible that I could have been one of those. Um, I've heard about a, a program called MK Talent that was happening in that part of the country, <clears throat> and I guess it's still possible that I received a little bit of subliminal programming and don't remember it. So uh, if you then multiply yourself by however many, how does that maybe relate to the kind of media being served up in, you know, in the megaplexes every weekend? I mean, and again, we're talking about this is Jesse Eisenberg, this is Kristen Stewart, they're pretty big movie stars. I don't think this film itself actually was a success, and that gets into another bit of, of Max Landis's sort of infamy. And again, we'll include everything I've, I say and play here in the show notes, where you can read the Vigilant Citizen article and get a couple of interesting reviews of the film, actually even just from The Guardian. I've got a link to Mark Kermode. I think he does just a good brief review of the film itself without looking into and peeling back the layers of the parapolitical. And there's also an interesting conversation with the screenwriter in another YouTube video that we'll include the links to in this. The film actually, I think, opened poorly, and Max Landis, of course, took to Twitter and and got mad at the public for saying, well, I guess you guys don't want anything new. You want, I think, the movie was beat by, you know, some sequel and some other, you know, regurgitated thing. So the film actually wasn't that much of a success, but... Every other week, it seems like there is some kind of CIA-connected film coming out. Um, Sicario from last summer, and like we said, the Jason Bourne movie is coming out, and that's just off the top of my head. Well, there's always been a sort of a moratorium on, on, on too much West Virginia information because it really is a, a secret base for lots of this stuff, it, and, and therefore, you know, it has to be sort of discouraged. Um, I think it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that he said it was ridiculous. How can you not say that that movie is about glorifying exactly what you asked him? You know, how could he say that that's not it? it clearly, uh -huh. makes tries to make it cool. But here's the thing: I think they're, I think he missed the boat because today's um, twenty or thirty year old probably is not in that group. Where, where they were in one of these programs. I think that it was sort of a time-specific thing that was uh, went under cover of UFO abductions, which they're not doing anymore because I think there's just too many people on top of that now, too many people on the lookout for mind-controlled UFO abduction really being done by the military. So there's a lot of consciousness about that. I guess my question is, are films like this, and, and I actually, I had a conversation recently with a couple of guys who do a show, I mean, you've maybe seen it, it's called The CIA in Hollywood, uh, Pierce Redman and Tom Secker, who run Spy Culture. They've been doing a series, and they've talked about everything from 
you know, Robert De Niro's sudden seemingly about face to pretty much do only work for and about the CIA over the last 10, 15 years. But we actually talked about a goofy ass Disney film called Race to Witch Mountain with The Rock, which had CIA involvement, which is documented. I want, I mean, what what do they say? You know, we'll we'll know our job is is complete when everything the public believes is a lie. Is it all that now so much is out there that much like we see, you know, John Kerry having to go to the heads of Hollywood studios just a few weeks ago to say, hey, you guys, we need to make some good, you know, counter ISIS propaganda. We need some good, you know, military movies and shows coming up soon. Is it possible they need to kind of keep controlling sort of the narrative as people can go online and read about MK Ultra themselves, they need a sort of swift movie to go, oh yeah, it's that program where they made people into awesome killers, right? I don't know if that's a question. Um, <laughs> I think what happened in the early 90s, that was about the last, that was the last, uh, last, what do you call it? Uh, the last hurrah of, of abducting people and, my controlling them against their will under under the guise of UFO abduction. Um, I think the military just turned at that time they turned their attention to the internet, and they just decided, oh, let's forget about this other thing. Um, so I think that since you can't hypnotize kids under the age of eight, it's really not it's not very doable. I think then you're looking at an age range of people born before. 1985, 1985 or earlier. Anybody after that probably would not go to this film or, or identify it with it, which means 32-year-olds would be your your youngest uh, group hmm. to be interested in that film. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so that may explain why it's not so popular in, but the, it's also all over the television. I mean, I, I think this gets into a bit more of just the change post 9-11 about how much sort of pro-military death media is out there. Well, they've just, they've. I mean, Woolsey, James Woolsey laid it out. He said, we're just going to flood the Internet with all kinds of bullshit. I mean, that's what he said. He didn't say bullshit, but... He said, "We're gonna we're gonna give people good faith distraction material," and that's and that's, <laughs> that's pretty much that's exactly what it's what we've got now. I mean, you've you've been at this for a long time, and I actually I remember the first place I ever heard you was when you would go on the Visigoth show, Beyond the Grassy Knoll, and you would basically you'd roll in there and you'd go through. Uh, uh, if you're talking about an event or talking about an, a, a date. I know you just kind of had bullet points of here are the facts and here are the people that were there and here are the names and the dates. And, and that, for me, has always been a good bulwark against an, inter, you know, an Internet filled with bullshit is to go back to the, to the root parts of things. So I know that in some ways now it all does seem so strange and filled with bullshit and hoax bullies and crisis actors and flat earths and all the doubles and all that kind of stuff – that's in some ways sought to become what alternative media is supposed to be. And I know in, in a lot of, you know, you and I would have much greater, you know, views and clicks if we had all capitalized letters and had things up and said, you know, stuff about something being solved and <laughs> exposed. And it's all become so sensationalistic that in like a lot of ways, we look at a lot of levels Either you're dumb or you're in on it, but either way, the end result is the same. So I I appreciate you kind of looking at something like this for me. Again, like I said, I kind of put you to the task of, hey, watch this movie, and I'm going to make you talk about it. <laughs> well, you know, I go back to the to the time when you had to go to the library to do research, you know, and, it, and, and so I, I just think for for us, facts matter a little more. Uh, <clears throat> there was, you know, what they're doing now is just hypnosis. It's it's confusion hypnosis. I, I think we talked about this last time I was on, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> when you want to deepen someone's hypnosis, and I've st I have a hypnotherapy um, 
degree, if you will, uh, you confuse them. So they can put out a <coughs> video. They they will allow a video that says Israel did nine one one. We go. Well, we have this Army War College guy coming right out and saying it. And then the next video is, uh, yeah, I don't know. What's all this shit? I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I say that? You're, uh, you're right. You, you had already said it before. <laughs> okay. I've already cursed many times. Okay. Uh, you know, well, what, every week there's something else found on Mars. I mean, they, they kind of quit doing that, but mm-hmm. but it was almost every day for a while. Another something or other found on Mars, you know, some bogus whatnot. But anyway, you intersplice those in <clears throat> with the truth and the truth becomes smeared or, you know, it's smearing by association. And I think this really started in 19, well, it's probably gone on before that, but in 1997, was it, when the Heaven's Gate cult killed themselves, I think that whole operation was designed to smear Martin Luther King's family because they came out with the same at the same time saying, we believe James R. Ray is innocent. Mm-hmm. And that was a big deal because you, you get all the blacks pissed off, man. Uh, that, there's nothing that, that, that the government fears more than getting black people pissed off, I think. I think they're really concerned about that. And so I think they had these cult people on hand ready to go um, to kill themselves just to cover up the... Uh, you know, who killed uh, MLK. It's clear as a bell when you watch the footage. I actually taped it. Um, so, and and I don't know, I, as we kind of always get towards, you know, April 20th, that those dates of April and then around May 1st, did we see very many events just sort of take place? Or in my head, it just seemed like, oh, this was a rather quiet one in some way, and a lot of it seems to hinge around Prince. Um, say that again? I, I was just talking about the names and the dates. If Generally, we look towards April 20th and May 1st and those kind of dates to have a lot of events. It doesn't really seem like we had that many, or at least that we figured out yet, but a lot of it seems to swirl around Prince for the most part. But that might be getting... Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we usually do have a bunch of stuff, and I like to think I had a hand in bringing that awareness to the public because I spent a lot of time uh, keeping a calendar. I don't know when all that... That must have been five, ten years ago. And through keeping a calendar, I found out that that they every year at the same time, same weeks, almost the same day, and, and it, with 420, you know, every every year there was another another hit and and man that that meme just exploded and now it seems like everybody really understands that there's been some other ones like that that uh can you hear me i can hear you i'm just kind of thinking and i'm thinking and typing (laughs) okay i had to move to the basement so i was wondering if you could still hear me oh yeah absolutely you're you're fine you're fine um but let's actually as as we've start to wind up this conversation about the film American Ultra. I think in a way we're talking about the film specifically, but in general we're sort of talking about the things that would have been in generations past abhorrent have now all become praised and all of it in some ways does seem to be very much out in the open and in your face. So now films being made, I mean, this is in some ways a far cry from the original Manchurian Candidate, but it's just got a slick, louder soundtrack. How did we get to that point? And ultimately, I think for me, in looking at some of the other films and some of the other memes that you're talking about, and that's why we're kind of talking about this film in the context of dates and when things come out and when films are released, sometimes luckily or sometimes planned a long time in advance. Looking at other films, do you know about the Purge film series? No. So they've made two movies and the third one's coming out this summer on the 4th of July. The Purge is set in the not-too-distant future where this newly formed government, after of course a collapse, has what they call the purge, where for 12 hours, one night a year, 
all laws are suspended and everybody can do what they want. So the first film actually has Ethan Hawke in it, and it's more of a sort of home invasion, a lot like Straw Dogs kind of film, where how, how far will you go, you know, to fight the monsters that are coming after you? Will you turn into a monster yourself? And it's kind of, you know, a panic room kind of feel. Then they followed it up with another film from the same director the next year of The Purge, and we see a couple of the characters that we did see in the first film, but it's basically a lot more on the streets, and you're with a lot more minority characters, and you see the effect of The Purge is actually about eradicating, you know, the poor, and it's about class war. And it starts to take on a little more kind of political social notes, again, with all the divide and conquer, and seemingly, you know, riots around the corner. It just all it has to do is the snap benefits get turned off in Walmart and you'll see them begin. But their third movie is coming out this summer and it's called The Purge Election Day. And it's about an unpopular presidential candidate. And it's coming out right as I think we're going to see things as we are seeing them today kind of reach ahead. I remember that show. now. The, I remember the first film now that you've discussed it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it they've it's really gone. I, I'm not sure how much further it can go. It seems like we've there's so much total bullshit now going on that I'm trying. I, I I think I think we're going to see action here. I think we have been seeing action. We've been seeing. Um, minorities murdered in large numbers in the last couple of years it's, mm-hmm. and and all the bullshit that's out there just numbs helps numb people to what's going on so i i, I am concerned that we're kind of heading in a, a very nazi-like direction i think it's still possible that we could have something like that and i think if Trump builds a wall, it's to keep us in. It's not to keep people out uh, from coming in. <laughs> well, and that's sort of what the first Purge film, you know, touches on in some ways. You know, you build the wall so strong that you've actually trapped yourself inside in some ways. But in this talk about the film American Ultra, you know, I, again, I've I've got a sort of running list of films that people have told me about and things that are of esoteric interest, I guess is the easiest way to put it. So I've been kind of catching up on some of these films from the past couple of months or couple of years when I'm doing my daily work now here, kind of doing the morning show and doing the afternoon DJ set, and then hopefully in the afternoon doing an interview or something as well. So just kind of watching some of the crazier films lately and, and, you know, surprised in some ways about a film like American Ultra being made, and in other ways not surprised at all because it just sort of came out, no one really saw it, and now it just sort of lives on demand like anything else. And it's just, you know, one more little piece of ephemera that contains a kernel of truth about the conspiratorial occulted history of, you know, of this country. So in some ways it's worth analyzing. And I know when I talk to a couple of other people about it, they're like, okay, I read your links. I don't think I need to see that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they planned this whole thing out going back to at least 1999 when Cheney decided he was going to invade seven or eight or nine countries. And all the military guys are going, what, are you crazy? You're going to invade Iraq? Because, you know, that's just going to inflame the terrorists. But that was the right, that was the point. That's the plan. They wanted to create this situation, and then now they're using it to scare us all uh, into... Uh, paying higher prices for everything. I mean, you name it. Uh, I just think the whole society is being manipulated, uh, and it has to be, it ha- can't all be from our own people. I, I just really think that that this is an in- international mm-hmm. program. Well, and I think a lot of the manipulation is carried out through mainstream corporate media so hopefully taking a couple of minutes to talk about some of the interesting things that may have slipped under the radar i think is is a worthwhile thing to do and again on these kind of shows i think in the future i'll talk about not only 
hey, this is a scary, bad movie. You should keep an eye out for it. But also look at things that are positive and things that we do want to praise and things that seem to be getting information out without some sort of bizarre, seemingly kind of ulterior motive. So I'm going to continue. Maybe I'll try and reach out to Max Landis and see if he'll actually want to talk about the film. You know, for me, like we're saying, we've been at this for 15 years now, at least myself and you longer, that now it is all out there on the web. All of this stuff, I mean, Max Landis is a young dude. 9-11 is probably a pretty seminal event in his life. And there, as you were kind of talking about ages, you know, most of the people now growing up only know a post-9-11 world. That's sort of the the quote-unquote reality that they only know. So I think trying to look at some of these things in a positive way, it, I, I wonder if Max Landis was just looking to tell a story like any kind of screenwriter and hit upon something kind of interesting. I, I, this doesn't strike me as this was planned and, and sort of shepherded along the way because in those kind of situations, it does seem to come out, oh, you'll find who the sort of military connected advisors on the films are. And I don't think we've necessarily seen that from this film, but perhaps there's more research to be done on American Ultra. Andy Colvin, any last words here on Media Monarchy? Well, I just want to say that his dad did one of the one of my favorite movies of all time, which I saw at the drive-in movie when I was young, uh, Schlock. Have you ever seen that one? I don't know if I've seen that one or not. Is it sort of like an anthology film? <laughs> no, it's no. a Bigfoot movie. Oh. It's a Bigfoot in California who gets loose, and <laughs> it's it's just a funny, it's funny. Uh, so I, it's one of our first Bigfoot movies. Hmm. Uh, he plays piano, you know, he's kind of smart and he's sexy. And, <laughs> uh, that was his first movie, I think. Hmm. Yeah. John Lennon. You might be right. You might be right. Um, but I wanted to say to people, if you're interested in this to- these kinds of uh, esoteric topics, go to Amazon and type in Saucer, I-A-N, Saucerian, and you'll get about 700 of our titles that we've been reprinting. Excellent. Saucerian. All right. Andy Colvin, thanks so much for talking about American Ultra. I hope, uh, you know, not to force you to watch (laughs) movies you don't want to, but sometimes I have to. Damn it, that's my job. I love the movie. I thought (laughs) it's a great movie. Andy Colvin, thanks so much for coming on Media Monarchy, man. Take care. All right, bye. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.